Hello, everyone, and welcome to the main Carmine Street Metrics. And um, I'm delighted to have everyone uh, gathered uh, here again from so many different places all over the country, thanks to the magic of Zoom. Um, we have uh, our co host, uh, Wendy Sloan, here. Therese Co was not able to make it today, but of course, we uh, curate these events together um, all the time. Um, it's really a pleasure to have uh, Jeff Harden, Susan McLean, and Richard Wakefield uh, read uh, with us today. And as always, we're going to start with a few open mic readers before we go to our first feature. The first open mic reader is Rick Mullen. Rick, can you please unmute yourself? Done. Okay, you can hear me? Uh, good then. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to read a Sistina, so I'll need all three minutes. <clears throat> so keep whatever introduction blathered down. I won't note that um, in this poem, I voice the narrator's memory of his childhood Catholic priest in the uh, voice of Chico Marx, um, which maybe that's something I should think about, but I'll think about it later. Sistina. Father Tuoso said, "E namini padre, stupid, stupid, stupid. What do you do?" Father, I said, "My mother's death was the fulcrum." Nah, come on, you. Tell her your truth to the foggy glass. The world went raw the day she died. Okay, stupid, stupid. When is she died? Almost 40 years after my father glanced for the last time into the glass that reveals a prodigal's how they do with the future. Nobody looks at you, sealing the form of my mother's death. Why do you, why do you, why do you, death? It is two score years since my father died and 50 years since I last confessed to you. And I, Damathir, my pacheme. All due respect to my biological father under glass who told me the one about glass houses prior to my first confession when death was a black and white cartoon, a howdy-do boy howdy. How many times she died? Here again, you ask the right question, Padre. Seven to date. Make no sense, okay, by you? I wouldn't have it any other way. The you, beloved of the Father, reflects on the glass that divides us in darkness, blessed Padre, my inquirer, seven nonetheless. Her death bent over backward on the day she died. That's an ogu. But what do you do? There is sunrise again, and we have to make do with the bouquet of chrome. I'm bothering you for a parcel of penance. A Catholic died in the wool and bled in the stormy glass, a lonely contralto, a stray on to death, the nominal seventh apostles compadre. And how many padres stupid or what do you do? Remember your death. Come on, come on, you, you in a glass, eh? Hey, you telling me who died. Thank you very much, Rick. Now Thanks. our next open mic reader is Claudia Gary. Claudia, can you please? Uh, Join the video and uh, unmute yourself. Yes, hello. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Nice to see you all. Thank you, Anton. Um, so I'm just going to, I was going to read something, a war poem, but I decided not to. I decided to read something more about finding peace. Um, this is called A Late Crossing. Out on the river's middle, where I hear and feel nothing for several milliseconds, Despite the purring ferry motors call to consciousness as usual, he floats time with a fishing pole, taking a breather as far as possible from anyone. No matter that the fish are sparse or nervous or indifferent, no matter that the pull, the line's awakening has not arrived all afternoon He's out there with a hook, a lure, 
a sinker and nothing to lose, he loses it. It skips over the smooth Potomac surface, vaults through my car window, settles on me. The ferryman approaches. He wants my ticket. There's a jolt, a rumble, as other drivers reignite their engines. Time has returned from break, and I'm amazed to see I've still got nothing. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Next up in my reader is Carol Nielsen. Okay, so last time I read a, read a war poem, and so I'm going to read something lighter. This is for spring. I wait all year to see blossoms on the cherry tree below my window. They begin as small green buds in early spring, then pink petals push through. It goes on like that for days, weeks, until full fat blooms emerge like butterflies escaping a cocoon. I admire the bursts of pink for days, weeks, until wind blows the fa fragile petals into the air like feathers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carol. Next up, Tony Treadway. Thank you. I can hear you better under the headphones. I don't know if I can hear myself, but you can hear me. Yes, you can. Um, can I read a poem? Apologies to the few who have. I have a message from you. I did unmute. Um, apologies to the few who have heard it before. That happens sometimes. Uh, did you know that avocados thrive on the same terrain, the same soil as the trees that support the monarch butterflies? Hmm. The poem is called The Trees Where the Monarchs Winter. In sacred groves, las mariposas gather in such gloriosas, 3,000 miles of hard migration by their golden navigation. Americano desperados lust for buttery avocados, flesh for mixing guacamole, a trendy dish, but not as holy as the fir tree oyamel. There the rafts of monarchs swell for winter rest in Michoacan until the sun and compass yawn. Quiet now, no hue or cry for that orange butterfly, our faces stuffed with avocado the winning chips of El Dorado. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. We have one more open mic reader before the first feature. Um, for the first time in this open mic, uh, please welcome uh, Dane Shannon. Thanks, Anton. Um, this poem is called, I Can Tell. I have spoken distastefully. No one else would, and I was angry. Call it presumptive youth, call it bruised, and put away a little too long. To tell the truth, I think I know this is no way to be. Now, I am not belligerent. I return few calls, I make fewer. I negotiated my lease. I appealed a loan denial. I have several friends. I know exactly what to say and how, my husband heard me out just yesterday. My boss believes I may be onto something. My mother and I are even reading the same book. I don't agree anymore that I'm dangerous. My words are too precise for accident or impulse. Trust me, I really care about what I do. My suggestions hardly devalue even the worst ideas by meticulous design and at the cost of accuracy, people respond and I'm not untoward. I ask questions to be considered but never answered. The answers are irrelevant. Everyone is captivated until we go to lunch for gossip as satisfying as it's creative. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dane. And I hope you join us again. Um, it is now 
my honor and pleasure to introduce our first, oh, our first feature reader. Jeff Harden is the author of seven collections of poetry. Full Sanctuary, which won the Nicholas Rorick Prize. Notes for a Praise Book, which won the Jack Carr Press Book Prize. Restoring the Narrative, Donald Justice Poetry Prize. Small Revolution, No Other Kind of World, XJ Kennedy Prize. A Clearing Space in the Middle of Being, and Watermark. Almost a thousand of his poems have appeared in the Southern Review, North American Review, Plowshares, the Hudson Review, the New Republic, the Gettysburg Review, Zone 3, and many others. His poems have been featured on Poetry Daily, Verse Daily, and the Writer's Almanac. Originally from Savannah, Tennessee, he is a professor of English at Columbia State Community College in Columbia, Tennessee. He serves as one of several editors for the online journal, One. Welcome, Jeff Harden. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think I'm going to start with a poem. I've been thinking about books a lot lately. Um, <laughs> I always think about books. Um, but uh, anyway, this is this is called Diminishment. It's in my uh, book, A Clearing Space in the Middle of Being. Um, and many of the poems in this book, I play around with a form I invented where I'm just kind of playing around with opposite words. But I would end a, a statement or a stanza, but I'd have a couple of words left over sometimes on a line by themselves. And I found myself dropping the next line. And at the end of that line, I would have the opposite word that I had just previously ended with. I, I really just kind of stumbled into this. But then once I discovered it, I tried to write a whole series of poems. So anyway, this is called Diminishment. So many books on the last chance cart needing rescued. Brightly lit jacket covers with huge yellow $2 stickers secured along the spines, obscuring their labored over titles. Better perhaps to remain untitled. In these lives we keep presenting at passing onlookers too distracted to look up from status updates and tweets. Alexandria's library, we're told, went the way of ash. While here and now, there's only here and now, and little worth remembering or going back to, that having lived a while longer might actually amplify. Could be a diminishment has long been underway with anything resembling wisdom more and more beside the point, not needed. It may be not even possible now that words keep disappearing, fewer choices to fit inside the screen. What happened to Bula Rasa, Dickinson, Basho, Dostoevsky? Can we still dwell in possibility? Will we forget the sound of water leapt into, the conscience come again, reminding of crimes we can't escape? Or have we found a freedom, finally, not to be tethered to a word's boundaries, to its demands, we live as if yes, meaning were not meaningless, but lay in abundance everywhere we look, both titled and untitled, sometimes slim, sometimes arms filled unbearably voluminous. And the, um, the book that I just have out, it came, it's, hasn't even been out a month. It's called Watermark. Um, and again, in this book, I play around with a shape I came up with about 18 years ago, where I was thinking about taking phrases from old poems of mine and making them the titles of new poems. Um, not a revolutionary idea, but it, it was something that got me to writing poems. But as soon as I wrote a title at the page, I thought of it as not horizontal, but vertical. And I placed the words visibly down the left-hand margin of a blank sheet of paper. And, and then I wrote these poems that kept stitching back through these words. And if you look on the, on the page, you would see the vertical phrase. Um, then this led me to thinking about phrases that had mattered to me. 
uh, many of which are from literature and the Bible and other sources. And so I made a whole long list of these. And then over the next uh, roughly about five years or so, I wrote um, probably about 40 of these types of poems. One of them, I started with the, um, and, I, and I thought of these as a kind of whispered prayer behind the poem, maybe something like uh, a subliminal message. I call it watermark because I took a book arts class in graduate school. And in that um, class, you know, people made handmade paper. And sometimes in handmade paper, there's a watermark and it's the evidence of its maker. And um, so I just, I wanted to create these phrases. Some of them are things like Rana Rilke, uh, you must change your life, or um, I've got Whitman in there, how soon un unaccountable I became, Dickinson, faith is a fine invention, I'm nobody, who are you? Um, this one's called Blank Page, and the phrase I use is, I have promises to keep by Robert Frost. I doubt we'll make it to some after time, some grand perspective looking back on this time in the way that now we think of yesteryear and think we have a clearer, truer understanding than we did while walking there. It's just as well we never fully know the folly of our knowing. I doubt that we could bear it. The poet's blank page promises everything, then less and less, then finally close to nothing, sometimes only silence, which may in the end be our true accounting. Whatever the age is coming to, we won't be here when it arrives, and all we tried to bring into being, to say or do, will be as breath upon a window pane. We've always known this truth, tried to keep from knowing it, tried to stall the quiet afterwards, tried to touch just out of reach what keeps us steadily reaching. Sometimes all we knew to do was to keep on going into the empty miles. This one uses a phrase from Ephesians 6, 19, uh, to make known the mystery. I spent a lot of time as a kid on a creek bank or along the Tennessee River, um, but I used to paddle um, in a canoe on, a, on several of the creeks in my home county, and that's kind of uh, in the background of this, into nothing of my own making. To follow the current is to lay aside the paddle to sense time's absence, which as a young man, I did one morning long before my life came rushing in. I hummed an old song, what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus and stared long into the deep surrounding me. My face undone, slipped loose to float among clouds. I think I've always known the mind wants more than what is set before it. Flash of purple wing, wind teased leaf about to fall. Wants more than what it can imagine, more than what imagination manages to hold. The creek took me farther and farther toward the county's core into the dawn time of creation into nothing of my own making, into being where I was, not caring where I was, alive only in the mystery of my presence being inscribed upon a moment, both passing and eternal. As the sound of water, the water of sound, our time being poured, pouring time into being. <laughs> And then I've had a, I had a little chapbook that came out uh, called Generosity for a Later Generation. It came out last year. Um, I thought I'd read one of the poems from it and then maybe finish with a sonnet. 
uh, what we give our minds to. Even after 40 years, a back road intersection comes to mind and I feel myself turning south along hayfields and deeper toward unknowns. The missteps I made would fill a thousand acres. The times I misspoke have crowded out words of mercy offered by so many others. Some days I try to listen out farther than the mind can imagine. Oh, my brother, I hear myself weeping, but have to move on through his absence. When I said, Lord, did I really mean sorrow or wind through thickets or how a barn leans for half of my lifetime without coming down? No doubt, I'm only shifting straw around, telling myself I'm building a kingdom. Theologians already are crossing out my words. And I want to finish um, with a with a sonnet from my from my book, um, restoring the narrative. This is called a praise of weeds. Some of you probably know an anthology is, I mean, it's a collection of flowers. <laughs> so, um, I, I was thinking about the ways in which we all kind of make our own anthology. So sometimes it's the poems that others have overlooked. A praise of weeds. Each of us makes his own anthology. The critics don't decide. With countless poems, nobody else may know exist, but which have hallowed what it means to be alive. Subversives, me included, carry books with turned down pages, starred lines, margin notes. Each poem a wholeness clarified by years of living forth it's held close subtleties. By nature, quiet truths do not engage to argue for their worth, especially to those gone deaf, haranguing some agenda. Some readers make an audience more lasting than official, reciting lines that faint the air with sense, resolved, prayerful, content. Thanks. Thank you so very much, Jeff. Uh, can everyone please unmute yourselves so we can applaud and express our appreciation. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. And um, you know, everyone, please order um, Jeff's books. Um, you know, maybe you can tell us about you know how to where we can um, get them, uh, watermark generosity for later generation, any of them, obviously it's very hard to launch books during the pandemic. So please support our uh, future readers as much as you, you can. Um, same for Susan, for Richard. Um, we're going to continue with uh, the open mic. Our uh, next reader is um, Jean Krilling. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Anton. Nice to see everyone. I'm going to read a poem from my new book, Shared History. It has a section called Sea Sonnets, and one of those is titled The Roaring. The wind pulled at his hair, the cold spray stung his brow, the sand blew in his eyes, and this felt just right for a fool like him who'd flung his last chance past the breakers. An abyss as deep as any ocean soon would claim what future he had left. He heard derision in crashing waves that seemed to roar his name, condemning him and his reckless decision. Who knew the ocean would be so unkind, would salt regrets, leave rages newly stirred. Enough. He went home, left the sea behind, and poured himself the liquid he preferred. 
He drank some scotch, then shuffled off to bed, but he still heard the roaring in his head. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Next reader is Jeff Holt. I'm trying to get myself unmuted here. Yes, we can I'm hear you. Unmute myself. Okay, great. <clears throat> I'm going to read one poem, uh, The Waiting Room. Um, this is the place where families cross their legs and stare sightless at unobtrusive art. This is the place where every minute drags like a dead body heaved onto a cart. A mother clasps her hands as if in prayer, then bows her head and curses quietly. A husband thinks that if he had just seen more, his wife would not be having surgery. Death breathes upon these souls who wait in need of angels wearing scrubs to proffer grace. All wait alone and none are reassured by memories of a loved one's pleading face. In purgatory, they await the words of gods who fail as often as succeed. Thank you, Jeff. That's it. Thank you very much. Our next reader is Rina Espaya. Thank you for inviting me. I'm glad to be here and to see so many wonderful faces again. This is called Questions. My grandson wants to know what churches do. It's a fair question. And I did, it's true, believe once in an answer someone knew, even if I did not. Something about the soul's devout delight and teasing out reasons in spite of reason not to doubt. I loved such exercises then, to swim against the mind's own current, past its dim light to more than light, as through a scrim of passing things. I'm tempted to reply, churches distribute maps, some travel by, and offer guides on how to live and die. It's an innocuous answer, I suppose, valid enough, but then, my grandson knows, being a thoughtful boy, how answers close sometimes, what questions mean to open. Force a tacit truce, a turning of the course from truthful unbelief to thin remorse. My grandson would see through, he reads me well, my tactful answers, careful not to tell more than I need about the flames of hell he's heard of from a friend who claims to know how everything 6,000 years ago was ordered in six days to be just so. How to explain the rapture people jammed into celestial ships, joyously crammed with saved believers while the rest are damned? How fear or wishful hope sends up in smoke the gift of intellect and makes a joke of artist, sinner, saint, but something spoke to me just now, Bach praising how light looks, dappled with stained glass, in silent nooks where scribes grew old, retrieving ancient books. Bells of my town calling with every beat the child I was to kneel before the feet of the Madonna. I inhale the sweet and sour of wax and body salt and wood and think of saying, churches make us good but cannot say it now. I wish I could. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rina. It was a pleasure to hear you. Our next stop at my creator is Chris Brandt. Okay, I'm gonna read a sonnet. Um, been thinking a lot lately about the people who have died recently, both those I know and those I don't. This is called loss. Not only our successes grow us old or we'd be trees which manage green each spring and harbor summer birds and yearly add a ring, then pull sap deep within as days turn cold. We too go on from gain to gain but what is lost we also carry, a time we would not speak, the embrace we turned from and saw the flower close in the hurt face, and our dead 
unnumbered dead, their names embossed inside our heads, shadows carved into the wall, the assassinations, mass graves, terrible disease, the ones we knew were tortured. We heard their pleas and we did not write the world. That endless fall, that burden we can never cease to know, no matter how far we come away, how old we grow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Have one more open mic reader before the second teacher. Next open mic reader is Bill Considine. Hey, uh, thank you, Anton. I'm going to read a uh, sonnet from my uh, most recent chapbook, The Other Myrtle came out last year deep in the pandemic. Um, and this is a sonnet, as I said, uh, I lost my place. Uh, but the lines are abbreviated. Fewer feet, no hands. <laughs> I slumped, I slumped, said my laboring friend and slept for years and fell, accused of savoring old adventures over beers. People disperse and do their own thing so fast. I lay sick and getting worse for years, but now that's past. I have an attractive girlfriend again, that's healthy. I'm busy again with good things. Our old projects lend enough for me to feel wealthy. I'll spend what memory brings. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. All right. It is now my pleasure to introduce our second feature reader. Susan McLean has published one chapbook, Holding Patterns, and two full-length poetry collections. The Best Disguise, Benner, of the Richard Wilbur Award, and The Whetstone Misses the Knife, which won the Donald Justice Poetry Prize. She also translates poems from Latin, French, and German, and is the translation editor of Better Than Starbucks. Her book of translations of the Latin poet Marshall, Selected Epigrams, was a finalist for the Penn Center USA Translation Award. Retired from teaching English at Southwest Minnesota State University, she lives in Iowa City, Iowa, and is currently working on translating all of Raina Maria Rilke's new poems. Welcome, Susan McLean. Thank you. I'm going to start with uh, my favorite form, the villanelle, uh, though I like to play around with uh, some of the repeating lines. All of the poems I'm going to be reading are recent ones. They aren't in either of my full-length collections. This is called Confessional. No one is more public than a poet. They get a taste for praise, which can't be sated. They're geniuses. They want the world to know it. They have a hidden scar. They have to show it. They serve up stoic postures, nicely plated. No one is more public than a poet. Some trauma maimed them in the past, although it may possibly have been exaggerated during the years they've delved and probed to know it. Don't tell them they should struggle to outgrow it or that their sense of mission is inflated. No one is more public than a poet. They've suffered into truth, so they bestow it freely. Their empathy is celebrated. They don't just pity misery, they know it. They've toured hell's deepest circle and below it. Their mask of woe is not impersonated, but no one is more private than a poet for nobody is listening and they know it. <laughs> Although the villain is my favorite form. I actually write more sonnets and that's probably true of most poets. This is a sonnet called My Mother and the Mysteries. 
After her diagnosis, she devours whodunits at Olympic speed. Although she snubbed ebooks before, at night for hours she swipes through mysteries by the Kindle's glow, starting a new one as each death is solved. My sister finds her more. Yet in a week or two, mom's driving passion has dissolved. Even short stories now can't win a peek from her. A weary patience, like a gray afghan, enfolds her. Poisons in her blood cloud her crystal mind with disarray. Frosts blacken her camellias in the bud as hidden killers lurk to take my mother from one unfinished mystery to another. Climate change is affecting more than just us. I was rattled to see that for the past two years, some of my lilacs have started blooming in September. This is called bewildered. The lilacs are confused. They don't remember. Has winter come and gone now? No, a drought has crisped their leaves like pie crust. Some in doubt, hold out flambeaux of blossom in September. Their swoony fragrance pierces like remorse. Did we not let them frizzle in the sun? And now they've come deliriously undone, throwing bouquets out as a last recourse. The bees too seem bedazzled. A fall swarm has settled on our pine. To leave their hive this late means they're unlikely to survive the winter. Hurriedly, while it's still warm, we call a beekeeper who nabs their queen and lures them to a nucleus box. He'll bring it home and feed them sugar till next spring. They would die if someone didn't intervene. And us, the patterns change and we're dismayed. While glaciers melt, lakes dry and species die, we flinch and look away from reasons why, trapped in a minefield we ourselves have laid. I love French repeating forms, but I haven't written many rondeaux. Uh, this one was partly inspired by a Cole Porter song. It's called, To an Early Riser. Not in the morning, please. You know how much I like to wake up slow. Without some coffee to unfreeze my brain and wake me by degrees, my ardor is extremely low. I don't need Weedley nor Merlot to make me more simpatico, just time. By noon, I'm fine, but please, not in the morning. So hold that impulse, Romeo, until I too can feel a glow as torrid as the Cyclades. We'll still have lots of day to seize and all the time we need, although not in the morning. The song by Cole Porter was, but in the morning, no. Borges wrote about various kinds of labyrinths, which inspired me to imagine one with doors. This is called labyrinth. At first, there are so many paths to choose. You peek through one door, close it, try another, backtrack, waver, search for tracks or clues, chasing a fading gleam, a swift-heeled lover, a dream of rest. Somewhere, a door clicks shut. It isn't one you want. Later, you find some lock when you've stepped through, disturbing. But it's not until a deadbolt locks behind a face you love that you feel stalked by fear. Suddenly, every click sounds like a shot as family, friends, and mentors disappear. Then words, the doors that open, most do not, show faces, but of nobody you knew. One door remains, the one you must go through. I was startled to realize that many of my favorite female writers were very short. I'm not particularly tall myself, but uh, that inspired my next poem 
called Small Wonders. Charlotte, tiny and homely, didn't care that heroines must be gorgeous. It's ironic, but plain girls' passions too can be Byronic. She built renown that lasted on thin air. Emily, short, intense, and much alone, because she never found an editor who comprehended what to make of her, made something of herself, unseen, unknown. Edna, known as Vincent to her friends, broke every rule she knew, jumped to every bar, went where she pleased and always went too far, burning her candle brightly at both ends. Dorothy looked petite and perky, but her takedowns left men gasping. With one quip, she'd leave a gash as biting as a whip or razor. Does size matter? Size of what? I usually write in iams, but my second favorite meter is Anna Pests, which seemed a good fit for my next poem called Waltz. Does anyone know how to waltz? From the cast of the play, not a peep. We were students in college in 74. I sheepishly lifted my hand. I had taken ballet as a kid. I'd watched films, but I never had danced it before. The director reached out for my hand, grabbed my waist, took a stance, and proceeded to whirl me in three step for turn after turn. I think she's in love, someone shouted. I felt my face burn. Yet how could I tell them it wasn't the man, but the dance? A little like flying, like floating, like spinning in space, a moment of perfect abstraction, ineffable grace. It's a little scary to see the kind of character that emerges when I write a persona poem. My next sonnet is The Other Woman. What makes you think your husband's what I want? Does he think that? He's dumb as mud, if so. To me, a man's a fast food restaurant, just grab and go. Maybe that hurts to know, but joints like that are everywhere and packed. It's not a lifetime contract, it's a meal. I don't do long-term. Obstinates attract. I'm bad for him. He knows, big fucking deal. Nobody has a long attention span these days. So what do you do when you're bored? Binge watch TV, drink white wine, find a man. You want security, but feel ignored and miss the fizz of what come what may. Guess what? We all end up alone. You think you're not? My last poem is a litany poem. Um, I often like to write a litany poem without specifying what the list is about. It's more fun that way. This is called Rationale. Because she knew it wasn't possible, but like the blankness she became while trying. Because she dodged control on principle and non-compliance pleased her more than lying. Because no one would understand. So why complain, sorry, why explain? Because not knowing makes it easier. Because the words recalcitrant and shy would dance just out of reach as if to tease her because the scorn she risked had dulled its edge from overuse when she was young, because she loved the unheard tunes and wouldn't pledge to honor vetoes stamped and vetted laws, because she didn't care if it was proper or likely to pay, because no one could stop her. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Susan, that was wonderful. Uh, can everyone please unmute yourselves? So we can all applaud. Thank you. Thank you. Now next open mic reader is Christopher Boger.
Hi. Um, no. I um I too have a book, but um to be honest, it's not coming out till June fifteenth. So, however, what I'm going to read today is is uh, was inspired by our host. Um, <clears throat> I got very interested in Sergei Yesenian about a year ago. And I began to start reading a lot of his poems, particularly the ones in the last quote of the village. Um, so this is called Dear Peasant Boy, Dear Poet, um, with an epigraph, Autumn Droplets, How Much Sadness You Inspire in the Heavy Soul. And one other thing I want to tell you before I start, I quote Yesenian, Yesenian at the end of the second stanza, his phrase, garden of skulls and rabid glow of corpses, comes from mare ships. Dear peasant boy, dear poet. Dear peasant boy, when first I saw your body stretched out in that floral divan, that thin cord around which you had so recently been hanging, cut now from round your childish neck, dangling beside your floral beer, your eyes squinting at me, your lips forced apart, as if you were trying to cry for help, crying, but not heard. I tried so not to cry myself. It's been so many years. Dear golden boy, you lie there naked now. Your head rests on a mortician's wooden block. What happened to your golden locks? A necklace of dark purple scar encircles your once so childish neck. A road of sutures travels up your chest, all the way to your chin. Your eyes still open, still plead. Your lips still parted, seem to need to tell what they can no longer tell. Mm -hmm. Wherever lost, you lie now in a garden of skulls, lit only by the rabid glow of corpses. Dear poet, does the white birch you so once, once so recently revered forever shed its leafy yellow tears for your lost youth? Like you, I too am a poet. Forever lost in autumn's love, I too yearn to hear what you are no longer able to speak. So I am forced to scout the ground below the birch's silver mantle, searching for the last of its fallen leaves, searching hopelessly in the golden fire. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. And yeah, um, Sergei is a beautiful tribute. Um, you can see his um, the, the portrait of Yesenian sort of behind my shoulder in the Zoom screen, which was on the on the cover of the book as well, um, which was uh, actually painted by uh, Shay Culligan, who does uh, a lot of covers for uh, Karen Kelsey for Kelsey books. Um, okay, our next reader is Harvey Spots. Um, okay. Can you hear me? We can now, yes. Okay, fine. Uh, let me get this nonsense from Zoom off. Uh, I'm going to do something I haven't done before, which is to read the poem that I read last month again, having embarrassed myself apparently by having read an unfinished version of it. So uh, this is War Criminal, hopefully the final version. The international, this is the, uh, uh, well, the international criminal court is not designed to act swiftly. Uh, mm -hmm. Epigraph. It took the ICC a lifetime, his and ours, to bring the charges. An eternity of Merlin-esque spell casting to find him guilty. Expositional photographs of Boca, of Mariupol, of Kherson, of Kharkiv bearing witness to what the dead could not, an irrefutable narrative of casual barbarism students will study, agriculturists dig up when rotating crops for years to come. Close-ups of unborns being sucked from their mother's wombs by his bragged of thermobaric bombs, needlepoint clusters of them provided the coup de grace, galahads of the prosecution visibly shaking as one by one they delivered their closing remarks. The defendant hunkered down in his bunker, swearing he knew nothing of what his troops had done. 
The Hague was littered with exhibits to the contrary. Berms of the mounded dead, having effectively changed both Europe's topography and Russophiles' closed minds. Shrieks of the suddenly childless, motherless, fatherless, the defendant's crimes not having been victimless could be heard outside the courtroom. Off-key choristers so piercingly keen that even his defenders shrank from them. Jack-booted apologists voicing the, argument, the arguments of Jack Dawes. Reporters, notebooks yellowing, put it to the public. He doesn't look so big now, does he? Sweat glistening on his balding head, rattling his shackles like some ghost of empire past with no judo move to kick his way out of truth's stranglehold. A thumbs down after appearing simultaneously on Interpol's most wanted histories, least wanted lists, confirmed by WAGs as a Guinness book first. Every so often, when ruling on procedural delays, a shiver was observed to have passed through the panel of three graying judges, three wise men, perhaps a wave of realization that what had occurred didn't reek of Arendt's banality, certainly not to those homeless and orphans on the courthouse steps awaiting a verdict so long in coming that by the time it was read aloud, some of us had already forgotten his name. Thank you. Thank you, Harvey. And of course, the last month's version was also certainly not embarrassing and uh, very moving. I was moved by, by it last time. And it's heartbreaking how topical it continues to be. But of course, um, it, it, it sadly is still. Um, our next open mic reader is Alex Peppel. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to read a, what I'll call a bastardized villanelle. Uh, and for some clue as to what this is about, let's call it an online, offline dating drama. Catfish, online meat. Paul bearers clumped on down the rainy street. Our date had happened at the funereal home. She typed in chain emails, I'd love to meet you there. As my sign on spiked, when Uncle Pete Cellar bound, missed forever, climbing for a tomb. Paul bearers bore on down the rainy street. Her eye betrayed air brushing skill. She beat a fly down with her cane. She whizzed, wet loam everywhere at the funereal home. Gross feet traced her face when she moaned, I'd love a treat. The chat fizzled. I meant to try a gnome, but answered. Online, here's where I'd use delete. Forecasters did not glean this sapped blood heat. Waterlogged boots, heavens, a water bomb. Paul, Paul bearers clumped on down the rainy street. Offline it is, yet I did pray for cheat codes for her mm -hmm. online games. Then the mouth of a tomb. Paul bearers eased their load on flowered sleet. She asked, continue? Let's now tweet this meat. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. I am now delighted to introduce our third feature reader. Richard Wakefield has taught college humanities for 43 years. For over 25 years, he reviewed poetry and fiction in the Seattle Times. His articles on American art and literature have appeared in many publications. Among other prizes and honors, his poetry has won the Richard Wilbur Award and the Howard Nemeral Sonnet Award, has been shortlisted for the Poets Prize. 
uh, his new collection, Terminal Park, from Able Muse Press, has just been released. He and his wife, Catherine, have been married 48 years and have two daughters, two sons-in-law, and two grandchildren. Please welcome Richard Wakefield. Thank you, uh, Anton, and thank you so much for inviting me. And also, I'm pleased to be following Alex, who I must thank um, for editing, publishing my two most recent books, A Vertical Mile and the newest one, uh, Terminal Park. Um, I gave Alex the big raggedy bags of verse, and he turned them into coherent collections that, for which I am forever grateful. My very first uh, collection was called East of Early Winters. It, uh, Early Winters is a, is a place uh, in the North Cascades of Washington State and East of Early Winters is a, a lovely valley uh, where my uh, late brother had a ranch for many years. As it happens though, uh, many of the, this particular poem that I'm going to read called Horses is not set on that ranch. It's set on a farm in Eastern Oregon, many miles south. They sent the boy to build a fire beneath the steel water trough after a week of freezing fog had hung a hoary wreath on every bud and leaf along the creek. The men were busy at the barn with new cold reeking calves. The boy would have to go. He loaded stove wood chunks he'd split in two until the shouldered rucksack bent him low. In 50 strides, the barn was lost or taken. He stood confused with cloud, more alone than in the broad summer fields, forsaken by or perhaps forsaking the life he'd known. He staggered along the frozen creek a mile. He knew the way, but in that cloud, it seemed all unfamiliar. He backtracked twice, and while he searched unsure, it was as if he dreamed his life and now awakened cold and lost. But then the looming rock crib marked his place to turn, made strange beneath a coat of frost. And then the pasture trail, a wispy trace. With no more landmarks to help him find his way, he had to kneel as if in prayer to see if he had kept the trail until from gray, the trough emerged a solid certainty. He found the water solid too, so made his feeble fire fed the growing flame, saw how heat and light rose up and played against the steel. And then the horses came. From formless white in single file appeared the thirsty horses taking living form, condensed from cloud, more solid as they neared. He stroked them as they drank and felt them warm with living heat that he had helped to save. Their breath plumed up in clouds, more fog unfurled into the void. And as they drank, they gave a solid living focus to his world. And a poem from, um, from A Vertical Mile, uh, one of those two books that Alex was so generous and helpful in putting together. <clears throat> this poem is called uh, Facing Uncreation. A one lane gravel road, a merciless grade, the engine running hot. But where was there in all those endless badlands, water, shade, all sun-dried dust, eroded stone and glare? We stopped. What hope we had, it wasn't much, was in the arid wind to dissipate the heat that left the hood too hot to touch. In sudden silence then we stood to wait. Remember, remember turning circles, seeing not a speck of life, no fleck of green or blue between the dim horizon and that spot of stillness fate or chance had brought us to? The deep and narrow gorges gouged and grooved ran everywhere to nowhere, pointless, sharp, as if the maker came, but having moved along, confused, left jagged scarp on scarp. The silence flagged and we heard all around a breath of wind across the measureless expanse, a slew that could have been the sound of spirit on the primal emptiness. Did you feel then as I did something rise inside yourself, beyond yourself, 
until we equaled all creation size for size, as if the void were given us to fill. I'm asking what I haven't asked before because in narrow halls and darkened rooms, I feel that something rise in me once more to fill another vaster void that looms. And from the newest uh, collection, which I believe the uh, official publication date was just, um, just last week, uh, this book is called Terminal Park. And Terminal Park is also an actual place. It doesn't sound like the sort of place you would want to go for a picnic, but in fact, at one time it was. Terminal Park reads the vine-covered sign where junkies and drunks reach the end of the line. Come morning, the coroner's van threads its way through under an overgrowth gone to decay. But this was a park once, the sweet countryside, a Sunday adventure where people would ride in the days of the streetcar, away from the grime and the stench of the city, both ways for a dime. The place wasn't named with sardonic intent. To them, the name literally said what it meant. This was, after all, where the terminal was, and the dactyl in terminal pleased them because it mimicked the clickety clack of the track that lullabied babies to sleep going back. And right in the center, a marvel was set. The engines were turned in a slow pirouette on a platform that carried the giants with ease in an arc of 180 degrees. But ironies happen. The auto age came and aban abandonment wrought a new turn on the name. The literal iron was scrapped and the place was left unattended a terminal case, now derelict shiver by fires in the dark with no return tickets from Terminal Park. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not the first person to get lost in Florence, Italy. Um, in fact, there's a long, proud heritage of people who have <laughs> gone astray in Florence, Italy. Um, and I had the advantage, having done so, of being able to draw on the things that they had written about having been lost in Florence, Italy. So this poem is called Dante's House. On a mid-December night, I went astray in the streets of Florence, dark and serpentine, an underworld of winding way on way. Lost in the realm of Guelf and Ghibelline, I abandoned hope of finding my way back by signs in undecipherable Florentine. A swarm of vispas rips uh, through the black piazza, spewing the sulfur stench of hell. But by their bug-eyed lights, I saw a plaque in English and Italian, placed to tell a lost soul this was Dante's house. And clear and close, I heard our Duomo's vesper bell. The church and poet told me I was near the safety I had wandered from alone. The night's despair began to disappear. I lit upon a footpath I had known by day and came full circle through the night to see, across a square of cobblestone, the steady beacon of our window light. And um, to, to uh, perhaps to compliment some of uh, Jeff's uh, biblical phrases. This, is, this poem is called Verses on Mutability with a line from Ecclesiastes. Um, there's no prize if you can spot the line from Ecclesiastes except the satisfaction of having done so. I found a rundown storage shack that stood where rows of fruit trees had been overrun, hemmed in and held up by the cottonwood and birches that obscured the orchard's sun. The handmade keep out sign was weather streaked in faded hunter green and nailed askew above the gaping door. The hinges creaked but seemed to croak, come in as I passed through. The smell of leaves outside gave way inside to dust where spotter web, spider webs had claimed the place. Now knots of moths and flies hung mummified and swayed as silk strands broke across my face. A winter storm had torn away a square of roof allowing sun and seeds to seize the spot beneath the, and start a forest there of sallow grass and tortuous knee-high trees. Men come and go, but earth abides, they say, to overgrow an orchard and a shack. 
If I should go but to return someday, I'd find no trace of them on coming back. Um, and Anton, I neglected to note the time that I began. So make, uh, make emphatic gestures when it's... Been about, been about 10 minutes, so, you know, another oh, okay. phone. Got a little time left? Okay. This is called to market to market. So this this is a, a, a roughly true. <laughs> I guess I guess all poems are roughly true. This is called to market to market. At thirteen, I was big enough to man a truck at harvest time. It took strong arms to steer the rutted gravel road that ran to the railhead past a dozen miles of farms. While smaller neighbor boys I knew were stuck with children's chores when even in their teens, I pulled a cloud of dust behind my truck and saw them pulling weeds and plucking beans. If you can swagger sitting down, I did. I gunned the engine, shifted gears, and thought I surely was the envy of any kid at stoop work in his mother's garden plot. A few short months, I drove the countryside, perched high and mighty on a truck that bore whatever else a bumper crop of pride that I would never find a market for. Uh, poem called The Nature of Things. Oh, actually, so I started with a poem about horses. We're getting near the end, if not at the actual end. So this is another poem that involves some horses. <clears throat> the Nature of Things. The dozen horses make a writhing knot against this afternoon of wind-blown sleet. Driven to preserve their vital heat, they nose and jostle for the inmost spot. If we had thought the storm would reach this height, we would have brought them in this morning. Instead, we'll slog into a muddy winter night to get the last one trailered, stalled, and fed. For now, my pickup cab is warm and dry. Through a quarter inch of windshield glass, I see the chaos swirling down the sky to blast the horse's involuting mass. Lucretius says their particles in flux from form to form, and so is the storm. And I'm involved, I guess, as I wait for the trucks and watch my wipers measure off the time. Sarah, we have time for one more? Or? One more, sure. One more, one more, okay. Um, Pilgrims, no horses involved in this one, but there's an ox. Pilgrims, another mile, another low rent shrine, your seatmate mumbles. Half the tour group stays, but you lurch down the aisle to get in line. A bus you've been one stop behind for days pulls out and you see weary faces pass like pilgrims grimly bent on plodding on. There's you reflected darkly in the glass. Before you recognize yourself, you're gone. Exhaust fumes spiral toward the overcast. You see a peasant in the distance stop his ox to let a tractor lumber past, axle deep in some anemic crop. The toilet shelter reeks. You turn away and shuffle with the line that snakes inside the sanctum where some sooty mosaics portray creation myths, according to the guide. The driver beeps. You decline to buy a postcard, but from the corner of your eye, you glimpse a swath of tile rubbed clean a blue as undefiled as Eden's morning sky. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Richard. That was wonderful. Um, everyone, please unmute yourselves. Um, <laughs> and uh, you can all show our appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For... Thank you, Richard. So thank you, Susan. Thank you, Jeff. It was a great. Great reading. Thank you to all of our open mic readers. Another round of applause for everyone that read today. It's... All right. That was wonderful. Let's not forget so... Alex. <laughs> <laughs> and not forget Rena too. <laughs> Great poem, Rena. I really enjoyed that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I hope you join us again.